Well, thank you very much, Eric, and thank you to Ilse and, uh, and CNS for allowing me time to speak uh, to you today. I should say, speaking of the, the whole issue of nudge, uh, I have a small confession, not any conflict of interest, of which I have none, just to make sure I get that on the record, but last night a restaurant nudged me to eat, consume French fries. <laughs> Um, so the, the, this morning was fascinating, talking about this issue of behavior and nudging. I want to take it into a bit of a different space, a bit of a different focus, really around the, the power of transformation. And you know, when you think about nudge, you know, how many nudges does it take and how sustained is the nudging before you get into true transformational change? We, I don't know if we got into that in depth this morning. And I was just thinking about how that conversation could be relevant. But I'd like to sort of look at the issue of transformational change and what that might mean for uh, nutrition, health, competitiveness, uh, and for the agri-food sector, and then ultimately the connection between agri-food and the nutrition and health sectors. So what I'm going to start with is just to acknowledge that food and health, as we well know, and nutrition are intimately connected in so many different ways. And uh, it's also a source of conflict, as you well know. And I'll touch on that just a, uh, just a bit. Um, but as we think about the issues, uh, and I'm going to get into this around, there's just a dramatic change of expectations uh, taking place, which affects multiple sectors. And in my mind, uh, this creates incredible opportunities if managed right. And so three general themes i like to touch on is, is really this um, adoption of systems thinking, uh, uh, but the potential for tr matters of trust to actually be a common connector, driver, if you will, motivator between the agri-food and the nutrition health sectors, and what that win-win opportunity uh, might result in. And then finally, uh, a question to keep in the back of your mind as we go through this, uh, what might be, uh, or is it possible that the agri-food sector and the nutrition and health sectors may in fact uh, be on the cusp of a new uh, partnership uh, or relationship? So I'm going to probe on some of that and uh, be interested in the discussion afterwards. So there's no question that, uh, that food and nutrition and health issues uh, converge at the plate. This is where a lot of the discussion uh, took place this morning. Um, it's also true that when we think of some of the co conflictual issues, and this is just one example of, of perhaps hundreds I could have chosen around what really could be uh, some of the source of that. And it really is, in this case, a campaign which is international, I think it's in 38 countries now, Meatless Mondays, where the, the campaign is avoid meat and not only do you improve your health, but you improve the prospects of the planet given the, the methane emissions and, and other environmental impacts of, of ranching and, and the cattle and the meat sector. I'm not going to get into whether this is uh, um, uh, uh, right or not, uh, but it does uh, actually hook back into something Richard said this morning around let's get nutrition right and then let's not, if I remember the quote, let's keep the environment separate. I'm going to take a small contrary view on that. I think we actually need to uh, start thinking of the connection across all of these domains and you'll see that coming out in some of my comments. When we think of food health issues, uh, wow, there's just so much. We could come up with a fantastic list ourselves. Here's four examples. Uh, I think that consumers do get challenged, uh, which ta taxes their capacity to trust, have confidence in the food health system, even government and regulators, whether it's the changing nature of science, is cholesterol bad, is cholesterol good, and there's been change there. There was some other comments made this morning. Uh, new technologies, and there's a concern around, is the fish I'm eating actually sole, or is it, some, or is it pollock? And so food fraud plays a role. Uh, certainly marketing practices, uh, which you are well familiar or are familiar with, uh, raises issues. And then there's also food safety. Are, are we managing disease outbreaks in a way that sh ensure confidence in the system? I should add, though, however, that Canada, along with the United States and some key, mo many key other countries, but Canada, of course, has one of the safest uh, food systems on the planet. And so we shouldn't forget how fortunate we are. But nevertheless, when the outbreak does occur and how we manage that can test uh, how we might feel confidence or it might test that confidence in the system. So some of these are familiar challenges. 
uh, and they're well known uh, from your standpoint. But what I'd really like to do is uh, step back and think about what's the changing backdrop to uh, some of these issues that we're all experiencing, and then come back to that central thesis. What's that partnership opportunity at the end of the day? So this is, a, in, in, in many respects, a familiar common view of supply chains. You've, it's a linear sort of way of thinking, whether it's from the research and input side to farming, uh, processing, distribution, uh, retail, right to the end use consumer. And this is what uh, some of the language uh, amongst regulators uh, and others, and even in the sector, they think of in terms of supply or a value chain. I think there's a very, very different view, so hold on, it's gonna get a little complex for a second here. Uh, I think this is the reality of the food system we're facing. And that the supply chains or the value chains are really facing a myriad of issues, uh, in this case divided into four quadrants. You've got matters of provenance. Where does my food come from? Uh, and matters of ethics. Uh, are, are we farming, producing, processing, uh, in a way that uh, takes care of, of people or other ethical matters that might come up, uh, biotechnology issues for sure. Certainly matters of sustainability, water, carbon footprints, uh, what's the impact on ecosystems, and finally health. And I think that when you think about your personal ch food choices or the food choices that we see out there, this is a complex, chaotic equation that people distill as to what really drives their thinking. And this is what the food system and the agriculture industry is trying to respond to as well. So in a way, we're all sort of in this boat of trying to understand what's out there. I'm gonna give you an example of how this actually plays out. Uh, and it has an environmental spin, but I think it might be interesting. Uh, this is something that uh, occurred uh, last year, it has to do with chili and salmon. And, uh, and what happened was that there was a massive algae bloom off the Chilean coast that wiped out uh, a significant number, 20 million farmed salmon. But really, the, what was fascinating is how all of the pieces came together to, to, innate, to make that unfortunate uh, situation happen. You have warming seas from climate change. You have uh, increased phosphate and nitrate rich agricultural lands that ran off and there was actually a large rainstorm which flowed into the water, created conditions for a massive algae bloom, a very stressed uh, habitat for fish. Uh, the, the antibiotics were applied uh, in order to uh, dampen uh, disease outbreak. That closed some U.S. markets for that farm fish. And as a result, the Chilean aquaculture industry lost 800 million uh, US dollars uh, in closed market. So talk about environment, health, and economy coming together in one picture. And it could also explain why that Meatless Monday campaign, where people are making those connections across those domains in order to judge and assess uh, how we produce, process, consume our food. Fascinating uh, uh, picture in my mind. So this is someone who, uh, for Canadians, uh, you may recognize, Mark Carney, former governor of the Bank of Canada. <clears throat> He's now the governor of the Bank of England. Why is this, why am I showing this to an audience of nutrition, health, uh, and regulatory experts? I think there's some really interesting principles behind what's going on with the G20. So Mark Carney is part of a central bank initiative to now start to better understand climate risk in terms of access to credit, to uh, uh, how pension funds invest their, fund, their, invest their monies, uh, access to insurance, and really, there's an initiative at the G20 level to uh, clarify how we report on climate risk. So the principles at play here is that these folks are taking a long-term view of risk and impact. And of course, uh, political cycles are four or five years. We're often at product development cycles, can be quite short. So often we're so tuned to the short term, yet there's massive transformational issues taking place reflective of the financial risk that climate change presents. It also brings in play um, new data, new measurements and metrics to try to cope with that. So hang on to that thought for a minute because uh, I'll come back to that. But you also see this play out in these interconnected issues around sustainability risk. So these are two covers of reports done by the World Wildlife Fund that looks at sustainable palm oil and sustainable soy. 
uh, and what they are doing, and you can see that they rank global food companies and suppliers uh, across the world. And essentially what they're trying to do is by using greater transparency and metrics, they're calling out where companies are falling short, delivering on, in this case, sustainability expectations. So for example, Tim Hortons was called out here in Canada for not doing enough to source sustainable palm oil. But it applies to the space that you're in. And so this group, Access to Nutrition Index, uh, is doing the same sort of thing. It's now uh, benchmarking and has for some time uh, some of the largest food companies and their contribution to, uh, con to, to contributing to improving obesity or undernutrition or why how they're not. And so what this is all trying to do is increasing the transparency use of the metrics and data uh, and, uh, tra uh, and uh, essentially reporting on scorecards of company behavior to change uh, how companies and their supply chains operate, which I'll come back to. So, Overall, you have all these tr pressures and trends, and there's so much more to draw upon. We could spend all day on just those pieces. But I, in my mind, what's happening is, I think, that w is that there's a wholesale shift taking place and recognizing systems thinking, and really what that could mean for, uh, for you and what it could mean for the agri-food sector is actually bringing convergence to the two, and I'll put government in that space as well. So a few examples on that. This may look familiar. This is uh, uh, from the Public Health Agency of Canada. It is uh, the One Health concept. Uh, there are several uh, uh, images of this from different jurisdictions around the world. But it's this connection of animal health, human health, ecosystem health, and how they converge and create uh, uh, issues ac across the board, both policy, uh, consumer behavior, and other things. Um, so this is a conceptual view, but I think in the health space what we're grappling with, and I don't have current numbers uh, for unfortunately, but when you talk about or when we think about the impact of diet and nutrition and so forth and demographics is the rising health care costs uh, for uh, jurisdictions here in Canada and undoubtedly around the world. Uh, this is playing out in the developing and the developed world. And in this case, I don't know if you can see the numbers, but the projected uh, budget of the province of Ontario in, uh, in several short years, 70% will be consumed by health care spending up from 40% today, or actually this is from about 2013. Uh, numbers. So how can you spend on anything when, um, whether it's highways or whether it's supporting research or whether it's defense or name your priority if 70% of your budget is consumed by one line item. And so this is a pretty compelling burning platform, if you will, for governments to and others to rethink how they are actually treating and dealing with uh, disease management and by extension nutrition. But this concept of systems thinking, of linking and understanding uh, cause and effect, is actually starting to apply now uh, to, the natural, to the natural capital space. So think of natural capital uh, as a bank account. And you have your soil, your water, your carbon, your ecosystems, and you want to draw that down. You want to produce food. And so, and, and then the food that you produce creates healthy people and more vibrant societies. But if we pollute our landscape, if we raise our rainforests, if we take down our mangrove swamps to produce shrimp, we're drawing down on that capital. It goes into deficit. And we want to keep that, de that capital in surplus so we can continue to produce food or have parks or have land to build on and, and uh, do other things and choose the right places to build and so forth. So natural capital is now increasingly part of the conversation around how we need to manage the ecosystem in order to produce the wealth and the well-being uh, that we all uh, enjoy today. And so this is another way of looking at systems thinking uh, that's starting to permeate discussions all over the place. And here's one. So this is uh, one of many, many companies I could have selected 
where systems thinking is in starting to become ingrained in corporate strategy. This is not uh, corporate, uh, uh, risk, uh, uh, corporate social responsibility reporting, uh, in other words, public relations. Uh, this is actually strategic reporting. Unilever, one of the largest companies and food companies around, has made a pledge actually to double its revenue and have its environmental footprint as a corporate driver. As a result of that pledge, uh, which it's seriously pursuing, it is uh, also said that it will source 100% sustainably sourced ingredients uh, across many different supply chains. That's transformational, because for it to make that pledge, it has to reach right back to the farm level in every one of its supply chains to deliver upon that credibly with metrics and data in order to ensure that it remains, retains confidence of the consumer, the shareholder, the consumer advocate and regulator and so forth. Uh, you can't see the bottom, I don't think, but it's, it has four quadrants, more growth, economic growth, more trust, lower costs and less risk. They see the conversion of that as actually forming their, uh, the basis of their corporate strategy. It's not use, uh, unique just to companies, entire subsectors are doing uh, similar things and there are a number of examples here but this is one. This is the global roundtable for sustainable beef and actually Canada was selected as the first country to, to conduct a pilot on what sustainable beef means but you can see here there's a link between what is socially responsible, environmentally sound and, and economically viable. Again it's that bringing together of those three domains to create change. I should say that governments are trying to do its part to bring convergence to some of these issues. Uh, this one was actually a piece of work that CAPI did uh, several years ago where we looked at uh, food systems across municipal food systems such as Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, a whole, whole host of others. How are they bringing convergence to matters of social policy, economic uh, policy, uh, environment and so forth? So uh, I won't get into the details and now there's also at the federal level a discussion on a national food policy. Nutrition and health play um, uh, or figure prominently in, um, in that document and we've yet to see really where that, or that intent, and we have yet to see where that will really go. But this is a, while that might be a, a local or Canadian um, or a national expression of what's going on, uh, this is really a very fascinating global uh, issue as you can imagine. A couple of examples here, again you might wonder why I'm showing you this, but uh, this is uh, the Paris COP21 response to global to climate change. Uh, 195 countries signed on of course to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, what we're seeing now are countries are realizing that in order to transform systems they need to work far, far differently together. Uh, and so we're seeing this also with the sustainable development goals. There are 17. Uh, we don't see much play here in Canada uh, on these. It sort of comes up in the international development space. Um, and so really it's about how do we, uh, how do we significantly uh, make progress on, if not eliminate poverty. Uh, and the interconnectedness of all these issues. Um, but I think this is going to be far more significant to us as uh, for companies and their supply chains, for a number of departments across uh, the country as time goes on. And here's just three examples. So goals, I'm just going to flag goals two, three, and six. Goal two is about food security and it's about nutrition. Um, and this is, uh, uh, if we really want to tackle matters of undernutrition or overnutrition around the world, um, how are we connecting that to access to health care and the adequacy of that? And then at the end of the day, and this is sort of, that was flagged by Eric, uh, some of the work I do as part of Water Aid Canada, um, in the developing world, if you have inadequate sanitation and access to water, if you have diarrhea every day, you will not retain nutrients in order to maintain health. So access to water and infrastructure is part of this. In other words, all these issues are connected because at the end of the day they're affected and 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 affected 
infected and 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 you'll see this play out in a few other ways this is a significant report that uh, came out uh, a little bit earlier in the winter. Uh, this was uh, 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 the Advisory Committee on Economic Growth was a group, an independent group, chaired by Dominic Barton from McKinsey, uh, the global consulting firm. This uh, group was assigned by the Min Federal Minister of Finance to look at what could drive uh, success in Canada. And that panel uh, came up with uh, something that in the agri-food space was completely unprecedented. And it, it actually pleasantly shocked the agri-food sector. And that is that the agri-food sector, for the first time, perhaps since early in the 19th century, was actually deemed to be a strategic priority for the sector. Think of that. Our land, our good water, our good regulatory reputation, the Canada brand could actually be a driver of economic growth. Um, and so they associated, they developed that concept a little bit further. They came up with a vision statement uh, to try to unify and express that potential. And I mentioned, remember I mentioned that there's sort of a lot of short-term thinking. Well, in the agri-food space, we have a five-year rolling policy initiative. Uh, every five years it gets renewed. Yet this vision talks about Canada's potential for the 21st century. So this is a long-term play because in a hungry, thirsty world, Canada's potential uh, to play a greater role is even more significant. But I'll also add that might be of interest is that it's not just about being um, uh, ex improving exports and occupying greater global market share, although that's a key driver. It's also about the challenges that we need to resolve to get there and add value. And this is where the Barton Council report had two. And one was how do we leverage that natural capital advantage that we have and how do we manage it properly to sustain robust growth and Im improve our environment and how do we actually improve nutritional quality of the food we eat. So health and environment or sustainability are central pillars of innovation drivers for this strategy. And I'm going to come back to that uh, in a second. So one thing that we did uh, uh, that is at CAPI and then with the public policy form of so this is between my transition and leaving CAPI. We actually went across the country and we talked to uh, 150 people in eight cities. Um, and what we did was we asked, what did you think of this? And it was clear that what we need to do going forward is that Canada's economic growth cannot be decoupled from societal benefits. That is the health uh, of its people and the health of the planet. Another key idea that came out was we need to really embrace a whole of government approach. And that is we need to look at health policy, environment, climate change policy, trade and agri-food policy in a much tighter fashion uh, if we're going to respond to these systemic issues that we all know. The federal budget did its part to help advance the discussion. I won't spend a lot of time in this, but it too identified uh, how to deal with a whole of government approach. It decided it's going to create six uh, innovation tables to respond. 
uh, to them. Uh, they will probably be announced in the fall. Uh, one will, is going to focus on agri-food. There will be another on the health bio sector. Uh, but what's fascinating about this initiative is that there also there was a dovetail to the so-called supercluster initiative. This is a $950 million amount that's earmarked to help speed growth. And how do we leverage our science and regulatory research capacity and the partnerships with industry to make it happen? So these are big plays. These are national. And this is the response that we have this great opportunity, so how do we leverage that? I'm not going to get into the science review, but there's a connection here to the federal science review. Again, we need to look at uh, cross-cutting um, responses uh, to the challenges that we face, and uh, I can come back to that in any questions. So you look at a combination of these reports, and there's uh, some familiar themes across all of them. And that common ground is what I like to focus on as I, as I start to uh, bring this to a conclusion over the next several slides. And that is, what's the strategic opportunity? Basically, what do we do going forward? But I just want to pause on one thing, that this isn't just a bunch of Canadians um, locked in their boardrooms thinking that, hey, this is a great idea. This is a global discussion. So this is the, uh, a report that came out earlier. Um, this year, January, from the World Economic Forum about the choices that food systems have around the world. And look at what's said here. I think I captured it pretty well word for word. We need to assess the true cost of policies and how health costs and national capital depletion are factored into budgets and planning. And then if we really want whole of government solutions, that collaboration, uh, can, act, collaboration can actually lead to healthier diets, improved nutrition, um, and linked to nutrition-rich foods. And by extension, an innovation marketing opportunity, competitiveness, jobs, and so forth. So this is a theme that's just per pervasive. Now, there are many examples of innovation across uh, the agri-food system. Uh, I've just chosen three. Um, Canola, of course, is a, is a huge innovation story. It's now Canada's largest uh, uh, cash crop at 27 billion, largely driven by the demand for healthier oils. Um, you've got dairy, there's a lot of innovation going on in that space, and of course, pulses with, that's well flagged around how do we link this interest in increasing fiber, protein, and there's also that uh, uh, pulses are uh, a fixed nitrogen in the soil, so there's a lower carbon footprint. There are many examples, but I wanted to acknowledge that just because there are these global trends that they're not to pretend to think there is an innovation that's always gone on in Canada around this space. But there's some other opportunities, and this is some work that started uh, with CAPI, and it's in broadened out, it includes the Canadian Nutrition Society, uh, the U of T, UBC, a whole variety of others, a discussion around, well, maybe there's an even bigger play here. And are we truly understanding the connection between the soil biome and the human gut biome? Do we understand those implications uh, in terms of improving not only diet, but improving uh, health outcomes and competitiveness opportunities and innovation opportunities across the system? So this is an emerging discussion, and I'm going to start, uh, excuse me, I'm going to jump to a very busy slide, so brace yourselves. But if you look at the triangle that to come, the conversation this morning was really in the top part of the triangle. Um, you can't see it uh, here, but basically this is how can we link uh, consumer behavior and diet at the top of that triangle right back to the so soil biome and water ecosystems, which is at the bottom of that triangle. And essentially between the two are every single stage in essentially the supply chain. It's, it's the animal feed uh, process, it's the agronomy practice, it's the crop inputs, it's uh, it's how we process ingredients, how we uh, uh, prepare our food, package, store, and uh, make available at the retail level. Every single stage affects nutritional quality. And there's a lot of work that's gone on in here. And so our role, at, or my role when I was with CAPI at the time, was we don't want to replicate that. But the question is, what is the link between the soil biome and the human gut biome? And is that something we should pay particular attention to? And so this is a discussion uh, that's continuing to evolve right now. 
So what do we make of all this? I, I think I might have thrown a little bit at you. Um, there's a lot of trends uh, and developments taking place. Uh, but what I'd like to do is try to summarize it uh, succinctly as I can, and that is that when we think of these complex system-wide issues, the intersection of diet, health, sustainability, and, ec and economy or competitiveness, uh, it's clear to me in any case that interdisciplinary solutions and joint leadership are a must. The second thought is that I think that achieving win-win outcomes is possible. Uh, maybe that should be win-win-win uh, if you broaden it out, but w the point being here is I think it's starting to change the nature of how we think about strategy and how we develop, fund, and support innovation. And, uh, I, I, and we can talk more about that. The third thing is it's all about sustaining confidence. And maybe that's not the right word, maybe it should be retaining confidence, but the point is, is that how we maintain trust and confidence with consumers is a vital part of that, um, and shareholders to some. And so this is introducing notions of government, uh, what are those governance practices? What about the right metrics and the right transparency? And it has to be done right in order to, again, circle back and maintain the, like, the, that ongoing confidence as the system evolves. And so with that, I do think that, um, that these are some of the makings for a new uh, relationship. There will always be conflicts between the regulator, industry, uh, researcher, academia, uh, among many, many others uh, involved in the food system. But I think that there are, there is the, a foundation to, to actually have a different conversation. But I don't think that working in silos anymore is an option. Uh, and uh, actually, you could look at this as a glass half full or a glass half empty. Either all these people are working together in their silo and therefore things are working well, or people are continuing to work in their silos and things aren't working so well. But I'll leave that to you. So thank you very much and uh, hope, hope you have a great rest of the day. Dan Salon, University of Toronto. So uh, I'm a systems thinker, so I agree with all of that, but I wanted to ask you about the trust piece, because you mentioned that early on as a very key piece of um, the vision of future collaboration between these centers that you, you share. But I would like to ask you, what does that look like? What, can you break that down a little bit more, please? What does trust look like? Yes. Yeah, I think uh, what trust looks like uh, at the end of the day is, uh, I, I, I mean, in fairness, we will never get to an equilibrium where everyone's going to just hold hands and trust each other and, and everything's harmony, right? I, I think what you do want is as technology evolves, as, as, uh, as, as people work differently together, you want cons the vast majority of consumers to continue to maintain trust in the regulatory system, that they trust the food system, they trust the food they eat, and that they genuinely believe that what we produce uh, is actually not completely undermining ecosystems. And, and you know what? That is a very uneven process because it's, everything's moving. But you want that confidence. And I think what we're seeing play out around the world is that we're really challenged, our institutions are being seriously challenged by retaining that confidence. Yet the world is continuing to face incredible stress in so many ways. So I think, I think we need to uh, ensure that we have, uh, and some in the, in the food sector call it social license to operate, we need to be able to continue to produce the food that we, that we want and need. But the onus, and this is part of the, the anti-in to this, is that there's need for greater transparency, traceability and metrics and visibility around those practices. And so the standard of care, the standard of responsibility will only increase. So I think trust will continue to be that, that piece that we want to all aim for, but it's changing behavior at every step of the, uh, every step of the way. David, I've got... I got one question for you relative to the economics of this in, the, in that report. So in this systems approach, is it really a least cost analysis moving forward on this continuum or is it a cost benefit or, or do you see a difference between those? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so Canada is blessed 
we have land, water, a, a good regulatory system, uh, a, a good innovation system. Uh, many countries are under severe stress. They're in deficit in terms of how they produce their food. Um, and I, there was all sorts of slides I could have brought forward on that. The, the reason why I raise that is that what Canada doesn't do is that we don't have the conversation as to how we can actually raise the bar in our competitors in order to actually improve performance uh, so that the cost actually goes up, but goes up for everybody, but Canada can fare better. I mean, if you think of how many countries produce their food, they draw down on aquifers to produce hay or to feed their dairy herds. Uh, that can only last for so long. And so we need to raise the standard across the board, which is a cost-benefit calculation, but it's part of a longer-term strategic discussion. And we don't have that uh, discussion enough. So that brings up the subject of how we subsidize food and how subsidies work, and I was speaking to that at lunch today. Um, subsidies play a key role in sustaining a system that perpetuates, I think, some of the challenges we face. Paul Bernier, Montreal. <clears throat> Thank you for the talk. Putting all things together, sorry, I'm losing my voice. Putting all things together, and now hearing you talking about stress of the land, and uh, isn't there, isn't it time that we also talk about ethics of using the land to produce food that is not real food, that is junk, that is not what we need to survive? We didn't get into uh, choosing foods that are right and choosing foods that are wrong. Um, that's not something that we wanted to go down or that path we wanted to go down. I think there's enough other places for people to decide what's, the, what's a good food or not. And as the discussion revealed this morning, there was a photo of a, of a woman holding up a brownie and, a, and an apple. Um, it's, it wasn't up, it's not up to us to decide, no, you can't have that brownie. Um, so where we decided or where we wanted to focus was to try to look at the bigger or a, or a broader trend which, that, which is around the world, so it's the growing middle classes in Asia, for example, uh, but even here in Canada, there is a growing interest in the nutritional quality of the food that we eat, or there could be. And so what does that mean for Canada in terms of, of our cropping systems, our feed protocols, in terms of regulation, and our, and our food strategy? So we were focused on that part, but then allow the marketplace and the regulatory battles that flow from that to sort out uh, who decides wh what foods should be grown or eaten. And so we wanted to stop short of declaring that certain things should or shouldn't be consumed or grown or produced. I'm not talking about you personally or your group, but generally as a society, because the message hasn't been around uh, so much about, it has been, but hasn't entered into the uh, global message in terms of ethics of building the land. It has, in, it has been part of the, the discussion in the 80s, but has lost a little bit of it. Well, uh, per, uh, maybe. I, th I think actually what is happening, and I referred to it on the sustainable uh, targets for growth for palm oil and soy, uh, you can apply that to sustainable crops, sustainable beef, sustainable seafood. I think that ethics is very much being considered and that people are very closely monitoring how food is grown and their impact. And I think the trend is only increasing. The issue that, that uh, so that's good news. The, the challenge part is, um, is the authenticity of the claims around those sustainable uh, initiatives. And are they comparable? Because you have a whole bunch of different protocols out there uh, that some compete, some are not very clear. And so, and that gets to that consumer trust issue that as these protocols get put in place and they are seen to be falling short, that will only uh, create mistrust. So I think the ethical piece is very much coming through. It might not be termed ethical, uh, but for example, uh, the shrimp grown in, in Thailand is, is grown in aquaculture where mangrove forests have been raised. 
So is that an ethical issue or is that a sustainability issue? Or is that a health issue? Uh, it's probably all three. Uh, but what is important is that uh, Loblaws, Metro, Sobeys, and others among global uh, retailers are putting in place sustainable seafood uh, protocols to try to at least shift the markers. And I think that's, the, that's what the focus that we are trying to understand.